in the Bible. And that is logos and rhema. Let's check out what these means. First of all is, is logos. This is the constant written word of God. It's divine reason. It's a divine plan. And John, uh, John describes Jesus as the word of God. We talked about it Wednesday night, which by the way, if you've been uh, missing Wednesday night, you're missing something awesome. You're missing a time of growth in your life. And I encourage you to come on Wednesday at 7. But we talked about how the, the word of God was present. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among men. And that Word that He's talking about there is Jesus Christ. And so the Logos, if you're reading in the Greek, in your Bible, and you come across the word Logos, it could mean the written Word of God, it could mean plan, it could mean Jesus Christ. Logos is how we get to know God. It's how we get to know His plan for salvation. It's how we understand the past, and we can look forward to the future because of God's written word. Can somebody say amen? Now, this is an amen, this is an amen sermon, so get, get your amen ready. Get it on the tip of your tongue, all right? Without the written word of God, we would not know how to live our lives. Without the written word of God, we wouldn't know what right is and wrong is. And that's where we find our world today. They don't know what right is and what wrong is. The reason they do not know what right is and what wrong is, and why that has been muddied, and why there has been no lines defined, is because they do not know the word of God. And I believe in this place, I believe that God is calling us not to know what the Bible is, not to know a few scripture, but to know what the Word of God is. An in-depth look of the Word of God. The second word is rhema. How many of you in this place have ever heard this phrase, well, that was a rhema word of God? Or, you know, you, you've heard that before, especially in the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement, we have heard that phrase before, well, that was a rhema word of God. And what that person means when they say that is it was a fresh word. It was an utterance spoken by the Lord. You know that that word that you received was from God and not from man. And, and so this is what rhema is. It's an utterance. It's a spoken word. It, it's something that you may hear uh, audibly. It's something you may sense in your spirit. It's, it may be something that somebody spoke to you. But... It's, it's, it's an utterance that God has spoken to you. It's fresh. Now, from the Logos, we can get a rhema word from God. Let me explain. Rhema words, get this. Rhema words come from knowing the Bible. They come from knowing God. If somebody is prophesying in the name of the Lord, but they don't know the word of the Lord, I don't want to hear it. Because a rhema word comes from the Lagos. And so that means scripture, prophecy, his law, his plans, and rhema words. Rhema words are a compartment of Lagos. A rhema word is a compartment of Lagos. It's, it's a subcomponent of the constant written word of God. So let's look at some truths about a rhema word. A rhema word always aligns with the Logos word. If somebody comes to you and tells you something, then you need to go back to Scripture and make sure it doesn't violate it in any way, shape, or form. It ought to align with the word of God. It should never contradict the written word of God. The second thing, a second truth about a rhema word is that it comes from knowing Scripture and storing it up. It comes from knowing Scripture and storing it up. When we know God's Word, then we can use it. And here's what I hear the, word, the Lord saying to us this morning. We've got to store up some different Scripture. We've been using the same Scripture for 20 years. Because we only know five verses. And God's calling us to memorize more so that He can take us to another level. That's good. He has a rhema word. 
But it's going to come from us knowing Scripture, storing it up in our heart, and then in the moment when the enemy attacks, in the moment when we're going through that trial, in the moment when we're going through that struggle, in the moment when we're going through hardship as a church, you can call out the Word of God and it'll be a fresh rhema word that applies directly to your life. And I believe that. And that's what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The word for word there is not logos. All my life I have thought that. How about you? I've thought that. But that is not the Greek word that is used there. The Greek word that's used there is rhema. So, the sword of the Spirit is the rhema word of God. The utterance that God has given you. And the way that He gives you that is by knowing Him through His word. And so, the spoken word of God is the rhema. And Paul, Paul means that in that moment when the enemy comes, we need to listen to God's voice. But we have got to train ourselves to get there. We've got to train our hearts. We've got to train our ears to hear from the from the Lord. Some of you are like, well, I, have n- I haven't heard the Lord speak to me in 15 years. I've never heard the Lord speak to me. More than likely, it's because you're not in your word. Not every case. But I, I, I believe in my heart, if you'll, if you'll begin to get in the word of God, that he will speak to you. Some of you are like, I know them crazy Pentecostals. They say that God speaks to them in audible voices, but I never heard in an audible voice. Well, maybe you need to get in the word and try it. Maybe you, get to, maybe you need to get, get to know God more. Maybe he'll speak to you more. I don't, know, I don't know about in your relationships, but when you speak to somebody more, don't they usually speak back to you more? When you spend time with them, don't, don't you usually build a relationship and don't there, isn't there more dialogue between the two of you? God created us in his image. So doesn't he operate like that? I believe so. And let's look at some scripture and some points and, and back that up a little bit. How, how do we hear a rhema word of God? How do we hear a rhema? How will we hear the rhema word of God? That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Why is that, Pastor Adam? Because the rhema word of God is the sword of the Spirit in which you can kill whatever is in your life that's pulling you down. Whatever, whatever you try, whatever trial you face, whatever trouble you're in that, that, that comes into your path, this is how you're going to defeat it, through the rhema word of God. And how do we get the rhema word of God? That's where we're at right now. Everybody following? Let's look at three S's in hearing the word of God. It's huge in our faith today. There are many Christians that believe you can only get a rhema word from reading Scripture. I don't believe that. But I do believe that it is one way that you can get a rhema word. I believe that as you read the Word of God, something jumps out at you, a verse jumps out at you, and and you realize that's the Lord speaking directly into your life. That's the Lord uh, uh, taking you and and cultivating your heart and taking you and, and, and rounding those rough edges when that Scripture jumps out at you and you know uh, sometimes you may feel those goosebumps uh, sometimes you just may feel that in your heart that that is God speaking to you that is a rhema word folks don't belittle it don't second guess it allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you in that moment I believe that's one way I, I, and, and, and I, I, I believe that there's other ways I believe that God can speak to you audibly he, there's, I mean there's references in the Bible that the word has spoken uh, out loud to people uh, we see Jesus spoke to Paul on the Damascus Road. We, we see other instances where, where God's voice was audible. I believe that God can speak to us audibly. I, I believe that the Holy Spirit can lead us uh, within us and, and give us that feeling. Some of you guys, you, you got that, uh, that, that feeling within you to do or do something. Some of you businessmen in this place, you think it's your good business skills, but really it's God watching over your business and giving you that unction in your heart. I believe that. And so I believe that those are all examples of rhema words. Um, and so just in those, in thinking of a rhema word, again, I want to go back to it, it cannot contradict Scripture. So it, it kind of goes back to, um, I heard this story, and, and, and so a rhema word cannot contradict Scripture. That's, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, but we've got to use our common sense and we've got to use our brains too. I remember hearing a story a few years ago how this guy um, felt like the Lord told him to put his child in the microwave. And he, he felt like that that was the Lord spoke to him and told him that. And, um, and he claimed that God had, had said to do that. 
If God tells you to do something crazy, you better have confirmation from at least three sources. Let me just say this. This is a nugget. People, His Word, and corporate worship. People, His Word, and corporate worship. God will give you confirmation in those three ways. All right? So check it against Scripture to make sure that it's the Lord. If God tells you to put your kid in a microwave, that's a contradiction of Scripture. And so that's just an example. All right? So let's keep going. Let's talk about these three S's to hearing a rhema word from God. See, seek, and store. These are three words I want to speak to you about this morning. How do we gain a rhema word so that we can use this, the sword of the Spirit to defeat anything we're facing? We've got to seize, seek, and store up. The first thing is we've got to seize the truth of, of Logos. If you don't have total confidence in the written word of God, the Logos, the plans God has created, the history that has been, then you cannot receive a rhema word of God. It's going to be very, very hard to discern when God is speaking to you. It will be very hard for you to believe that it's actually God's voice speaking into your life. It's, it, it'll be hard for you to understand, is, is that God really, is God the one I'm really hearing? So what do we believe about God's word? That's a question. What do you believe about God's word? We believe that the Logos, the word of God, is inerrant, infallible, and inspired. Inerrant, infallible, and inspired. There are some that may not believe this, and, and, and I say this to prepare you. I, I thought that most Christians believed this fact, that it was inerrant, it was infallible, and it was inspired. Some of you are like, well, I don't even know what that means. I'm getting ready to tell you. I ain't got it. All right? In fact, I found some pastors who don't believe that, that God is infallible and inerrant and inspired, and I'm just like, how do you preach? How do you have confidence to get in the pulpit to preach God's Word? So let's look at what it means. The first word is inerrant. It means nothing is contrary to fact. That it's all fact. Every historical story, every event is all fact. And we have many, many instances that has been proven through historical accounts outside of this. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Inerrant means that nothing is contrary to fact. Infallible means without error. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, I read this to you last week, in which it is impossible for God to lie. And so what that means is that it is without error. And if you go and you study the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's probably our, our latest uh, artifact from the Word of God. It lines up almost 95 98% to what we have today. Now, some of you are like, well, that ain't 100%. Well, you got to think about, <laughs> you got to think about uh, translation. You got to think about the way they wrote back then and the way we write now. I'm talking about some commas and some periods. I'm not talking about some words. That's the difference. And so we believe that it is without error. There is nothing in here that has error in it. It is God's perfect, holy, pure word. Amen. And then the third thing is that it's inspired. It's God breathed. I heard, I, I read this quote from someone. God breathed out His Word, and the Holy Spirit guided. And that's exactly what happened to these writers in Second Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen and seventeen. Paul explains this to Timothy: All Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, if you go back and you look at those things. Some of us don't like to be taught. Some of us don't like to be rebuked. Some of us don't like to be corrected. Some of us don't like to train. But I'm here to tell you today that if you'll do those four things and allow the Logos Word of God to impact your life in that way, it'll change you and you'll be better because of it. Amen. We've got to seize the truth of God's Word. When we go to talk about God, it cannot be with our uh, tails between our legs. We've got to be stand confident in what we preach and what we teach and what we stand for. And we believe that the Bible is without error. We, we believe that the Bible is inspired. We believe that there's nothing contrary to fact written in His Word. And when you understand that, then you can read it with confidence 
knowing that it's not man who wrote this, but it is God who wrote this. And though it's just pages, or maybe it's on your iPad, it is directly from God Almighty. Hallelujah. We've got something precious. We don't even realize what we have. Have, has any of you ever seen the book of Eli, the movie? I know, it's, I know it's crazy movie. I know it's got a lot of language and violence. But man, the way that he hoards that Bible, the way that he protects that Bible throughout the whole movie, that's how we ought to carry our Bible. That's how do we, we ought to reverence the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Listen, I'm guilty of it too. I'm preaching to myself. We have got to look harder at the Word of God. We've got to understand it better. As your pastor, you need to be pushing me. Push me. Let's go together. Let's learn together. I don't know it all, but I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to be rebuked. I'm willing to, be, I'm willing to train. And if you're the same way, then we're going to grow together. Amen. And so we have something sacred. Value this Word. Value the Word of God. Understand its power and its potential into your life. Amen. So we've got, we've got to seize the truth of the Logos, the Word of God. Second thing to get a rhema word. The second thing we need to do is seek Logos, or seek the Word, or seek the author of the Word, or seek the Word, Jesus Christ. Y'all following? Can I just be honest with you this morning? I'm ready for a move of God. Some of you in the back, y'all ain't got it yet. I'm ready for a move of God. I'm ready for revival. I'm ready for us to spend hours at this altar. I'm ready for us to abandon our selfish ways. I'm ready for us to humble ourselves and come to an altar. I'm ready for us to humble uh, our, our self-righteous self. <laughs> I'm ready for us to put down the walls and Put, take, take off the mask and, and, and to lay our sins at the altar. That's when God's going to move. That's when God's going to move. That song, God's going to send a revival all over this land, has been in my heart this week. God's going to send a revival all over this land. It's going to start in our hearts. It's going to start with one person. I was visiting with somebody this week at the hospital. He said, there's been many times when I wanted to come to the altar and I just didn't. And I said, well, man, if you'd have came, you might have started a revival. He said, thanks. I said, I'm serious. It just takes one. It just takes one. It just takes a spark to ignite a fire. Listen, I'm ready for God to move. I'm ready for God to move. I'm, tar I'm tired of doing it my way. I'm tired of, I'm tired of going through the motions. I'm ready to seek the author of his word. I'm ready to seek the Logos. I'm ready to seek the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. I'm going to do it. I want you to join me. Let's seek him. I'm ready to see what God can do in your life as your pastor, as we abandon ourselves. You've got to abandon yourselves for revival to happen. I'm ready for many of you to receive the rhema word for God, from God that changes your life. But I want you to know, we will not see revival. We will not see redemption. We will not see change. We will not see or hear rhema words from God if we do not seek God. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Deuteronomy 4.29 says, but if, you, from there, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find Him if you seek Him with all your heart and with all your soul. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 18 through 20, although most of, the, most of the many people who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Azakar, and Zebulon had not purified themselves, watch this, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. Watch it now. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the Lord who is good pardon everyone who sets their hearts on seeking God. You see that? Pardon, pardon follows the seeking, pardon follows the seeking, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even if they are not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. He pardoned them because they began to seek Him. He pardoned them because 
Hezekiah went before the Lord on their behalf. Psalms 14, 2, the Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand. Do you understand this morning? Any who seek God. Hebrews eleven six says, And without faith it is impossible to please God. It's impossible for you to please God. But anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Acts chapter 17, verse 27 and 28. Is this okay? I just want to, I don't want you to believe me. I want you to believe the Word of God. Acts chapter 17, 27 and 28. God did this so that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him, though He is not far from any one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are His offspring. Listen to me this morning. Are you living and being in your faith? Are you living and being in what you believe? Is the very essence of your life centered around your belief in Jesus? Are you seeking Him on a daily basis? Because here's some truths I want to throw at you. God is looking for those that seek Him. It's what we get from these scriptures. God is looking from heaven to see for see those who are seeking Him. Do you see that? Do you hear that? Number two, God wants you to seek Him. God does want you to seek Him. Number three, if you seek Him, God promises us that you will find Him. And number four, if you seek Him, you will be rewarded. I mean, it's a no-brainer to me. It's a no-brainer. God wants you to seek Him. He's looking at you to see if you are. And we're promised that we'll find Him if we seek Him. But not only that, we're promised a reward if we do seek Him. It's pretty, it's pretty cut and dry, right? And so, to get a rainbow of word, to get direction, you must seek God. This is kind of one of my soapboxes, but and I seen a girl with this tattoo on her on her arm. Uh, this week, yesterday, me and Lacey went on an all day date for her birthday. Her birthday's coming up this week, and I got a pedicure yesterday. It was awesome. Brother Jason, who's here today, told me he was going to rebuke my or take my man card for that, but I'd do it again. It felt good. And a girl had this tattoo, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. You know, and I said. Said, have you ever studied verse 12 and 13 of that? She said she had it on her arm because of, it was a grandmother's favorite verse. I said, have you ever studied verse 12 and 13 of that? She's like, no, nah, not really. I said, well, let me tell you about it. She's getting her nails done. Lacey's getting her nails done. And I'm over there in the chair talking like this. And it was a good time. But let's, read, let's read Jeremiah 29, 11. You got your Bibles? Turn with me. It's probably going to be on the screen. I want, I, want to, I want to teach you something the Lord laid on my heart very early in my life. We use this verse all the time, right? Does anybody know this verse? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future, right? We know that, right? We're like, yes, God has given us plans for our life. That's awesome. And we let that verse by itself just encourage us. But after we're encouraged and we don't hear nothing, we're back to where we started. Let's go and read verse 12 and 13 real quick. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Watch this now. This is good. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So what God is saying, business owners in this place, what God is saying, teachers, and, and what God is saying, uh, 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 blue-collar workers, white-collar workers, what God is saying is this. If you want to know the plans that He has for you, then begin to pray and He will listen. Begin to seek and you will find Him. He has a rhema word for you. He has the plans for your life, but it is not going to come on a whim. It's going to come when you begin to seek Him. Amen. Amen. And we get that rhema word, and that is the sword that we can use to defeat the enemy. But we've got to seek Him in that moment. We've got to seek Him in that moment. The Lord convicted me on something this week. You know, too many times we go to Google instead of going to God. 
We go to Google instead of going to God. Like I'm, I'm making, I'm, I'm making this personal. I hope this is all right. So I'm, I'm trying to buy a lawnmower. I'm gonna buy a lawnmower. Yep. Snapper went out, sold it. Good news. Um, it was older than I was, so it's good. Um, so I'm trying to decide which mower to buy, right? So I'm like googling everything, you know, which is good. You should, you gotta do. But in the end, I really didn't get anywhere. Instead of going to Google first, I should go to God. God. What, which lawnmower do you want me to get? Which lawnmower is going gonna, is gonna to best benefit me and my family? God, I know you can speak to me. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm going to the Lord on which lawnmower to buy. I know that may be, may be trivial to you. But listen, my God says if you'll seek me, you'll find me. My God says if you got a, I'll give you a rhema word if you'll just begin to look into my word. If you'll just begin to study. If you'll just begin to, to seek me, you'll find me. You'll find some answers as you begin to draw near to me. And I believe that. Some of you are like, well, well don't believe it. Go, go to Google. We'll see how we fare. All right? God's going to give me a good long more. I'm not faithful, but it's going to be good. It's going to last me a long time. Let's go to point number three, the third F. I'm having fun. I hope you guys are. Storing up the Logos. In Ephesians 6.17, this rhema word comes from storing up Scripture. You have got to store up Scripture in your heart. I used to say this a lot. Maybe you've heard me say this. We have a gun. Our bodies are a gun. Our bodies are a weapon. And the way that we put ammo in that gun to use it to slay our enemy, the ammo is the Scripture. The ammo is the Word of God. If there's no ammo in the gun, it might as well be a paperweight. It can be something you can throw at somebody who's coming at you. That's about it. But it cannot be used to its fullest, get this, the gun cannot be used to its fullest potential. It makes a dynamic impact without bullets. And the same for you. If you want to reach your potential, if you want to make a dynamic impact in the lives of people, then you must Put in some ammo. You must put the Word of God into your life. You must sharpen the sword. And so, I think of it like this way. A boxer trains hard for his opponent. He studies film. He looks at, at the past. He knows his own strengths. He knows his own weaknesses. He practices. He gets his body into shape to prepare for this big fight. Right? That's, what's, that's what reading and memorizing Scripture is for us. We're preparing for the fight. We're preparing for our day. We're preparing for what's ahead. We're getting it. We're, we're training our spirit. Paul says physical training is of some value, but spiritual training lasts for all eternity. Amen? And so, now, the boxer doesn't, when he faces, when he's in this fight, he don't know exactly how the fight is going to go down. He doesn't know the moves of his opponent. He, do, he doesn't know when he's going, uh, when his opponent's going to use a left or a right, but he's prepared to respond when that happens. And that's what the Word of God does for us. It prepares us to respond the right way when we are faced with temptation, when we're faced with trial, when we're faced with an enemy, when we're faced with a person, when we're faced with a decision. The Word of God trains us to respond the right way. Good. Thank you, Lord. And so that's how His Word helps us. We store it up in our heart, and when we're attacked, we use it to stand our ground and defeat our enemy. And so from Scriptures, we see that many men and women did this. I want to share with you two of them, two amazing men from Scripture. One of them is David in, in, in Psalms 119, 9-11. How can a young... Is there any young people in here? Young. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about. That's why I wanted to see those hands. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? How can some young people in this place stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. That's how. I seek you with all my heart. There's that word again. Do not let me stray from your command. Watch this. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you want to defeat the enemy, then you've got to store up scripture in your life. If there is something in your life that you're struggling with, you need to go and read scripture that, that tells you the truth about that issue. If it's homosexuality, if it's drunkenness, if it's slander, if, if, if it's lying, if it's gossiping, if it's cheating, if it's 
If you're in an adulterous relationship right now, you need to go to the Bible and start reading about adultery. If you're, if you're whatever sin that, that you're struggling with, if it's lust, if it's pornography, you need to go to the Bible. This is, this is something you can go to Google on. Google scripture that deal with pornography or lust or, or homosexuality or lying or gossiping or slander. Whatever you struggle with, I dare you to go and read the Word of God about that issue. Because the truth will set you free. Amen. And so what David is saying is, is get some knowledge about the Scripture and hide it in your heart. That way when you're tempted to look at porn, you can pull up uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 about sexual immorality. All other sins are outside of man's body, but this one is inward. Uh, when you think about committing uh, adultery on your wife or you're lusting over another woman, you can, you can think about what, what one of the Ten Commandments, do not commit adultery. You can, you can hear the words of Jesus saying uh, that, that lust is wrong. You can know those scriptures in your heart. And you can fight with that. That's storing it up. That's, that's, that's how you get that rhema word. God brings it to your memory in that moment. And He's speaking directly to you. And He's saying, don't you violate my word. Hear my word. Listen to what I'm saying to you. And so, that's what David did. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, we see Jesus used this. Jesus answered, and I preached on this recently. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but I want to show you this. I, didn't, I learned something new. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Matthew says this, and this is the words of Jesus. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. All right? So let me just sum up what he's doing. He's quoting scripture. Y'all with me? All right? He, this is in response to Satan's temptation. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, what word do you think is used right there? You think it's Logos or you think it's Rhema? It is Rhema. 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 And how did he get a Rhema word right here in this scenario? How did he get a Rhema word? How did he know what to say? Because he knew Scripture and he knew his Heavenly Father. That's good. And so the word used in this first temptation is Rhema. We learn what the word teaches in regards to fighting temptation. But we also see it on display when Jesus is tempted by Satan. And so if we're going to defeat the enemy, we must memorize Scripture. We must store up the Logos. If you read a little further in Matthew 6, Jesus says, store up things in your life that matters for all eternity. Don't treasure up things in this life that's going to fade away. Don't store up tr treasure that will fade. When we memorize Scripture, it's for all eternity. It's something that we can take with us. Learning about the character of God and drawing near to Him, that's something that you're going to take with you. You're investing into something that is eternal. Your soul is eternal. Your soul will remember the, this Word. Your soul will draw nearer to God through His Word. And so it's something that can benefit you for all eternity. In conclu conclusion this morning, as the band comes, I want to tell you that the sword of the Spirit is in this place. I want to tell you that this morning can be a morning where you kill something in your life. I believe in this place there's some people, you need to destroy some things in your life with the sword of the Spirit right here in this place this morning. Right here in this place this morning. And I believe that if you'll humble yourself and come to this altar, God will restore you, redeem you, renew you, strengthen you, and you'll be set on a course to change the patterns in your life. Some of you in this place the only thing that you're addicted to is mediocrity. Being mediocre. Let me say it again. Some of you are not addicted to a drug. You're not addicted to a lifestyle pattern. You're going through the motions really well. But you're addicted to that mediocre mindset. And God wants to give you abundant life. He wants to give you more. Some of you are settling for the bottom when you can have the top. You're settling for the stepchild benefits when he has engrafted you into the main vine. The truth will set you free. Seizing the truth that God's Word is inerrant, infallible, and inspired. Seeking God and storing up the Word of God in your heart will set your life on a different course. 
And if I hadn't made this clear this morning, God's given us a rhema word. Whatever you need to kill this morning, we can do it with the sword of the Spirit. In preparing to close, as you stand with me, preparing for the conclusion of this service, Lord, just put this part, put this scripture on my heart, and I've got to read it. And it may be offensive to some people, but I just got to read it. First Corinthians chapter six, verses nine through eleven. Get this in your heart this morning as we leave. Paying attention. Got this. Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church, you know, we say all the time, man, this world is corrupt, this world is crazy. It's no different than the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was crazy. Everything that we're seeing today, they saw then. Nothing's new. People are people. Media maybe publicize it more. They may see it more. But people are still struggling with the same thing. You're still struggling with many of those things. There's people in here that are struggling with some of the things I'm getting ready to read. God's revealed it to my heart. Maybe nobody else knows about it. We need to kill that thing. We'll take some time around this altar today. Hear the words of the Lord. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What are you saying, Pastor Adam? If God can wash them and sanctify them, then He can surely wash you and sanctify you this morning. About every sin imaginable is mentioned right there. Not from the words of Pastor Adam because he may know you, but because of the Word of God. I'm not pointing out anybody. I don't know who the Lord, I don't know the person the Lord has laid on my heart, but there's somebody in this place this morning. You need to kill a pattern. You need to kill a lifestyle. You need to kill a sin, a temptation in your life. And the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is in this place. I want to help you do that. I want you to close your eyes with me and bow your heads. I want to open this altar up. This is a time of humility. When you come to this altar, it's a time of humility. You've got to humble yourself and realize that you have a problem. Put your pride to the side and come and bow down before the Lord. You can do it in your seat, but man, it's more powerful if you come because you really mean business about killing this thing. If that's you in this place this morning, and there's something in your life that you want to kill, you want to destroy, you want to put it out of your life, if there's something in your life this morning, I want you to make your way to this altar right now. The band begins to play a little bit louder. Is there anybody else? There's something in your life you need to kill. You need to allow the Holy Spirit. There's more people in here. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to do that. Humble yourself before the Lord that He may raise you up in due time. Hallelujah. Come on, band, begin to play and sing.